down, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Confess that I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what I have done, by what I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I am truly sorry, and I humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on me and forgive me in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Give you all your sins, our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
Noble your church with the heroic witness of all who gave their lives for Jesus. Grant that the victory of St. Ignatius of Antioch may bring us your constant help as it brought him eternal glory. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And told you, and now tell you even in tears, conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their stomach, their glory is in their shame, their minds are occupied with earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we also await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things in subjection to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, beloved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response for Psalm today is, The Lord delivered me from all my fears. The Lord delivered me from all my fears. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord. The lowly will hear me and be glad. The Lord, Lord deliver me from all my fears. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us together exalt his name. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. The Lord, Lord said, Look to him that you may be radiant with joy and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard and from all his distress, he saved him. The Lord delivered me from all my fears. The angel of the Lord encamps around, us, around those who fear him and delivers them 
taste and see how good the Lord is. Bless the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord deliver me from all my fears. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now, and forever. Amen. be with you. May the Lord be on our minds, on our lips, and in our hearts as we hear his holy gospel. The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My apologies. It is the gospel of John. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, beginning in voice, uh, verse 24. Jesus said to his disciples, Amen and amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. preach and um, got a lot of hard guys to follow. There was a, a real story with Bishop Jones with that outhouse story with the, uh, you know, with the campground and, and he made it really clear that wasn't his stuff. It was other people's stuff he was dealing with and Bishop Simpson with the letter of forgiveness. I wonder if my name was on there, but if it's, it is, please scratch it off. Um, and um, this morning I just was thinking, you know, a lot of times I've been asking the Lord, I just, I've been busy for a couple of years now, and I just said to the Lord lately, I just really want to connect with you in a deeper way. And I really want to just, you know, sweeten that relationship, take more time, 
do those things which busyness often drives away. And one of the things that I've been realizing more and more as I've been dealing with different people is I, I wonder how we see the church. I wonder how we see the kingdom. I wonder how we see, and then I turn around and reverse that, and I go, I wonder how the, those in heaven see the church. I wonder how those, like the Lord, sees the church and the kingdom. And when you think about that, there's sometimes I think we so easily uh, go into, you know, I think bad theology comes sometimes from one-dimensional vision, which means that, you know, for instance, with salvation, you know, we'd like to say, I'm saved, I'm being saved, I will be saved. But some people just say I'm saved, and it's a one-dimensional thing. There's no, there's no time in it. There's no, there's no flex in it. And I think that sometimes with the church, we kind of can enter into that place. So this morning, I was really happy when I recognized that it was the feast of St. Ignatius of Antioch. And he's one of my, my heroes. It's, he's a man that I really have come to love and, and admire and St. Ignatius of Antioch was a student of John the Beloved, the one who laid on the chest of Jesus. He and Polycarp were both trained up by, by St. Uh, John, and they lived in a time where when he was made the second bishop of Antioch, the, his consecrator was St. Peter. St. Peter consecrated St. Ignatius of Antioch, and he became a bishop in like 69 A.D., and he lived until his martyrdom in 107. And there was a neat thing. If you ever take the time to read the Fathers, one of the neat things about St. Ignatius is there's three letters he writes to John about the Virgin Mary. He says, please send her to us. Our women want to see her. They want to see the Virgin. She's full of good gifts and all these things. And it, it talks about James, who looks has a, the image of, of Jesus. And you, you start to feel that first century Christianity but St. Ignatius kind of flips things for us. He makes the kingdom different than we see it. He takes a view of his martyrdom as he starts to tell people not to pray off his martyrdom, not to stop the fact he can't wait to meet the beasts, the lions that are going to deal with his life. And what he's saying is that he really wants to be in that place with Christ. So that's kind of where I'm going to come from from my sermon today, is that I really want to look at the church. I want to, I want to hear from St. Ignatius, the great bishop of the church, as we're preparing for uh, Father Jason's consecration. Sometimes consecration and crucifixion are kind of the same words. You know, there's a crucifixion that comes with it, and it's a healthy and holy thing. So I am talking to bishops because I'm looking at how the first century looked at bishops, how the first century looked at what it meant to lead the flock. So who are we? And my answer is going to be the one church, and that may scare you, and it may raise questions in you. But I want to kind of talk about that this morning because I think it's really important for us to begin to understand how that works and who we are. So in today's gospel, not the gospel that was read today, but it's just the same thing. Unless a, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it's not going to produce something. In the gospel, in your daily readings today, it's the confession of uh, Peter with Christ. Who, am, who do you say I am? And he says, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Faith, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal that, but my Father in heaven. And it goes on, Jesus says, unless you take up your cross and follow me. So there's this cross-bearing situation that we, we begin to do and we begin to... Um, Make sure I get this right. Bing. There we go. So I just want you to look at that because it, there's a quote there by Spurgeon that says, there, crown, there are no crown wearers in heaven that are not cross bearers below. And there's this place in us, unless, unless we are willing to walk out that life with him. And interestingly enough, if you look at it, the, the, the souls of the martyrs in heaven it says they're in Revelation, it says they're under the altar. They're mixed with the sacrifice of Christ. Because of their lives being part of that sacrifice, they're altar bound. And so as we start to look at uh, St. Ignatius this morning, I wanted to kind of, uh, let's see if I get that. Okay. I want to talk about this a little bit because as he is that, uh, that one for us, he is a protector 
Um, I think I went one too far. Let me see if I can figure out a back way. Nope. Okay, well, I'm going to have to just leave it there for now. But he is a kind of a protector. He was, he was born again, and he saw that church in heaven and earth, and he wrote letters to lots of folks, and he started to talk about the church, and maybe in a different way than we might have heard. I want to read you something from his letter to the Ephesians. He says, For if I in this brief space of time, have enjoyed such fellowship with your bishop, I mean not a, um, not a mere human, but a spir- his spirit- of a spiritual nature, how much more do I reckon you happy who are joined to him as in the church, as in Jesus Christ? That is, as Jesus Christ as to the Father, so that all things may agree in unity. Let no man deceive himself. If anyone not be within the altar, he is deprived of the bread of God. For if the prayer of the one or two possesses such power, how much more than the bishop and the whole church? He therefore that does not assemble with the church has even in, by this manifested his pride and condemned himself. He says, for it, is, it is the, for it is written, God resisteth the, pride, the proud, and let us be careful not to see ourselves in opposition to the bishop in order that we may be subject to God. And what he's saying is that the, the early church understood that where the bishop is, there's the church, the assembly of the, of the firstborn, the, the, the people that are gathering. And what I want to push past is that it's not just the church on earth, it's the church in heaven. We are, we are connecting with the one church. And I think that that becomes such an important part to us because we start to recognize that there is way bigger things than we sometimes think in our one-dimensional mindset. We were visited uh, last week by a man who um, I was asked by one of my priest's wives for her brother was visiting us, and he was a missionary in the Philippines, and he was in Mindanao. He had married a Mindanao uh, woman, and they were up on a mountain somewhere ministering to a lot of uh, poor f- people. And one of the things that he did is he came in and wanted to talk about all these experiences he had, some with uh, exorcism, but some with these theophanies where he had people that were praying. And so suddenly three or four of them were able to see the holy city. And I started thinking about it a little bit. And I'm going, the holy city, well, I know it's there. In my mindset, someday that's going to come down, that new Jerusalem. But the fact that it's already there and in place really impressed me that I started to think about that, that there's this place where the gates are the 12 tribes and the, the, the stones are the 12 apostles. And I started thinking about that. And he said these people would pray and sort of end up on a street together in the city and could see things very similarly. Now, whether you believe that or not, I don't know. But what I would say to you is the thing that becomes important is that we start to see that there is this heavenly city, that there is this place, that we know that God, the the Father, is seated and at the right hand is the Son and that he's surrounded by 24 elders and thrones and that somehow those thrones move out and they somehow govern from there in this place. And as bishops, I really believe that that's where we have to be connected. We have to be connected with the government of heaven because it truly is nothing more than the outreach for the government of earth. There's one church, the church triumphant, the church militant, but one church. And we're we're surrounded by their witness, and we're we're called to be part of that. And I think that that is one of the things that St. Ignatius sort of talks to us. We know in our mass we say, Sir, some corda, lift up your hearts. What? We lift them up to the Lord. We go to that place. The altar is a place of ascent. It's a place where we come together as the body on earth and assemble with the body in heaven for the one sacrifice, for the joy of heaven. You know, one of the things that St. Ignatius taught a lot about, he taught about two things. There's one, he was known for his orthodoxy, which is right teaching. But he also was known for orthopraxy, or practi, orthopraxy, which is right practice. In other words, you can know the right things theologically, and not do them. But he did those things. He was, he was a champion of those things. He walked out both legs of those. 
he said really clearly, I want to quote this because I don't want to mess it up because it's such a good quote, but he says, I prefer death in Jesus Christ over the farthest limits of the earth. He who died in place of us is the one object of my quest. The one object of my quest. He who rose for our sake is my one desire. He was single-minded in his, in his love of the Lord and in his, in his approach to him. And I really believe that we as the church need to look at that and understand where we are. And I am just encouraged to say to you, he was the first person to use the word Catholic that they have on record. He, he understood the church as Catholic, one church. Not just universal, but one in its practice, one in its life. One Catholic and apostolic church. He was one who gave us so many letters and epistles of which we have great understanding, which lent itself to the creed. In his epistle to the... To the uh, in his epistle to the uh, Magnesians, he writes, Study, therefore, to be established in the doctrines of the Lord and the apostles, that so all things, whatever you do, prosper both in, in flesh and spirit, in faith and love, in the Son and in the Father, and in the Spirit, in the beginning and the end, with your most admirable bishop, and well come compacted spiritual crown of your presbytery and your deacons who are according to God. Be you subject to the bishop and to one another according, excuse me, even as Jesus Christ is to the Father according to the flesh, the apostles to Christ and the Father and the Son and the Spirit, there also may be union in both flesh and spirit. He understood that one church to be Okay, thanks. Just tell me next slide. Yeah, let me just make sure I know where I am because I have lost my place with the slides a bit. So let me, uh, okay, that's a good place where we are right now. That's fine. So what he says, to, what we, we look at in our lives is that as we take up our cross to follow Christ, as we start to move into that place where we become cross bearers and, and do that, we must be the one church. We can't let ourselves be d d divorced from that. The bishop must endeavor in one hope, one faith, one baptism, that God has taught us that there is one in the kingdom. Our quest must be like Ignatius. Give me one more, please. Um, that he would, it would be a single-minded quest for Jesus. Our quest for what wisdom is to follow him. And the crown is his kingdom being glorified. In six, in, I'll get you to go one more. St. Luke, in the 15th chapter, gives us this story. And I think it's Jesus speaking, and he's talking about the parable of the woman with the lost coin. And I think it's just really important to us, because this lost coin is a symbol of, you know, she's lost something. Of course, Jesus is illustrating what it means for a lost sinner to be found and those kind of things. But I think there may be more that we can see. Um, I'll have you just go one more forward. But God wants to do something with the church, and as we go forward looking for that coin, she can't find the coin. She has a broom that's sweeping, and until there's a lamp lit, she doesn't find what's lost. And I think sometimes that unless we call more and more and more on the Holy Spirit to light the path, we're not going to find the way. In fact, when the light's found and she finds the coin, it's tied to the heart of God where he says, there's more rejoicing in the kingdom of heaven over one sinner who repents than of all these other things. And we look at this and understand that the light, the woman maybe is the church, and, and the light of all that has gone on starts to bring us to that place of where we could start to see in the darkness. It says, we see on this side of the veil in that one church, it says we see through glass dimly. You know, we're stumbling about. We're trying to find something. The souls of the just now made perfect, it says, they see clearly. They're praying for us. We ask for their prayers. I ask for the prayers of St. Ignatius and many others. Next slide, please. One of the things that the Lord has called us to be is this charismatic Episcopal church. And when you put those two words, you look at them, to be charismatic bishops. 
to be bishops that move. But sometimes I think we limit the charismata to the understanding that it's just the gifts. It's just that we sing good songs or we, we operate in the gifts that are here on the earth. But I think really, maybe, we could understand the charismatic bishop to be someone who can easily go between heaven and earth, who can go between the veil, who easily can climb into that place of the government of God, who can easily hear things and see things and learn things from people who have gone before us. I think it's people that can slip into the, knowing the truth, that we have orthodoxy and orthopraxy, that we start to begin to be those, those men of God. See, there's nothing new under the sun. It doesn't matter who I am or who you are, but it does matter to God. And when he sees the church militant, he sees it differently, I believe, than we might see it. He doesn't see how, just how many people are there. He sees how are you governing, what's going to move on the earth. The patriarch's been talking for a long time, and, and you've got to watch it because he slips it in quietly sometimes. But he's been saying about being martyrs. There's a season of martyrdom coming. It'd be hard to prove him wrong, but he's, he's said it many times, right? You've been kind of trumping that. And it's not something you go, oh, that's warm and fuzzy. I can't wait to hear more about that. Tell me how that's going to work. But you can't ignore it. He's sent to us. He's given to us. He has a word for us. And I think that we need to start to, to reevaluate that, but maybe reevaluate martyrdom. We are, um, give me the next slide if you would. I want you to think that the bishop is this person that's to be a wise manager of the household. He's to be someone who's managing the house of God. And as a wise manager, he kind of speaks for God. Just like the manager in the story, he's the one who can handle finance for God. He's the one who can appropriate things. He has that that's, he's like a signet, like a ring that can to speak for God and, and do those things. And the bishop, as that manager, as God has selected him, he should be revered as though God was speaking from him in a sense. And because of that, the responsibility of a bishop is tremendous. It's just we're, we're, running, we're walking through that, that situation. I'm going to get to the next slide, but he's a minister of the mysteries that God has given these gifts for those that are walking in this life and as a minister of the mysteries see the work of the church is to make known those mysteries Ephesians says and we as he ministers in those mysteries he begins to bring us into the mystic union with Christ himself with the whole church and it, it's one of those things where I really believe that as he is doing those things that we start to be um, we become something we weren't. The church becomes bigger, not smaller. The church becomes part of two-thirds of the angels that didn't leave. The church becomes part of those who have sown resurrection into their lives through the work of Christ. The church becomes something that's moving that will not be moved. The church becomes part of the Word incarnate. The church becomes part of God the Holy Spirit. And when we start to walk in that place, we start to realize kind of how I think St. Ignatius was seeing the church. He was seeing the church as a one church. We are in that place where so many times we're wondering, like, who are we? I know with the CEC, there's been so many times early on that I wanted a T-shirt that says, we're not this, we're not that, we're not this, we're not, you know. And what I would say to us is, I'm really not going to do that ever again in my life. What I'm going to do now is just say we're the one church. We're part of the church, the church triumphant. We're part of the undivided church. We're part of the church. Instead of looking at the splinters of the church, I want to look at the, um, I want to look at the uh, whole church. The splinters are nothing but the fracture of the church. So we're not to be in this place of... Um, Wanting revival, we're to be in revival. We're not this place that's supposed to be just the flesh, but mystical. 
The gifts aren't just on earth. Schism and divided church is something that, quite frankly, is not how Jesus sees the church. He doesn't see the church in all our splinters. He sees the church as one. Give me the, the, we must always point to those who are not the divided church, but to the church. And those splinters are not the, the end of things. So if you go to the last slide for me. Okay, I must have missed one then. If we go to that place and we ask who we are, I think we come to the place where the bishop says, he makes these words that are just so uh, almost graphic. He wrote seven letters of encouragement, and he wrote all these instructions to Christian communities. But in the end, he just kept thanking the brothers and sisters for their concern and their well -be his, for his well-being. And he followed through with his witness of fidelity. And he basically said words like, um, I don't want you to pray that I'm not consumed by the beasts. I don't want you to pray off my, um, I don't want you to pray off my martyrdom. Really interesting thing that would happen along the way, as some of the early church bishops would be going toward their martyrdom, other bishops would ask if they could stop by on their way into their, their place, that they could pray over them to give them their, their charism, that they might carry that bishop's charism with them as they walked out the life. He basically says then, at the end of, of his letter, he basically is saying that I want to be martyred. He was set under Trajan for not denying Christ, that he was going to go to Rome and be consumed by the wild beasts. And he talks about his life as being gnashed or noshed upon by those beasts, that he would become grain and part of the bread. He gave a Eucharistic illustration of what his martyrdom looked like, that he would be joined somehow together with the sacrifice of Christ, that he could prove his ultimate fidelity to the one who had become the object of all of his desire, that he could be one with Christ. And that flips the church upside down for us somewhat, doesn't it? It makes the look of the run home not so much a run away from death or a run away from life or, or fear or fear of the enemy or fear of this or fear of that. It makes it look like a triumph. That oneness with Christ changes everything. And so this morning I just wanted to remind us as both bishops and people who are hearing how important it is to see the church with new eyes, to see the church from heaven to see the church and to say, then, then what is the CEC upon this? What did God do? In many ways, when you look, at, you look at different things that God sends along, for instance, when you look at the body of Christ and you see some parachurch organization rise up, it's to show us something that's missing. I believe God wants our eyes on the one church and to speak the one church to the church. I think that that's the witness that we are. And I think it's way bigger than just being charismatics where the gifts in here, you could get healed and go to hell. It's bigger than just the earth. It's being one with the whole church in heaven and in earth. One with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One that what it, we start to wonder into what it means to be seated in the heavenly places with him. We start to look at our inheritance and say, that's our city. Today, I, you have the best readers here, by the way. Everybody's got the coolest accent. But today, our citizenship is in heaven, right? We, we belong to something. So let us not forsake the thought of that and gather ourselves together with this great martyr. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
strong to find that unity in Christ alone, uh, particularly when a bishop presides at the Eucharist. Lord, in your mercy. We again pray for our nation in this uh, election season. And uh, we pray for an end to the hatred, anger, violence that's spoken. And rather, Lord, help us focus on a future uh, for our children and our grandchildren to leave a legacy, knowing, Lord, that you're on the throne. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for um, the, uh, the Jewish people around the world. We pray, Lord, for voices to raise up that would silence the hatred of anti-Semitism. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for um, the passage of uh, various uh, amendments and resolutions um, that, that would ban abortion, uh, that, Lord, you would uh, make that happen. I especially pray for, an, for uh, a large no vote on Proposition 4 in Florida. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who face martyrdom uh, every day, um, in, uh, for particularly our bishop in Pakistan, uh, the Nigerian bishop, Lord, in your mercy. I invite you to pray for anything you care upon your heart. Hasten, O Lord, the coming of your kingdom. Grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may behold Jesus at his coming again in glorious majesty. All these prayers we offer up to you as you have taught us to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. Let's greet one another with a sign of God's peace.
goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become the body of Christ. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become the blood of Christ. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all-powerful and ever-living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. Your holy martyr Ignatius of Antioch followed the example of Christ and gave his life for the glory of your name. His death reveals your power shining through our human weakness. You choose the weak and make them strong and bearing witness to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. In our ending joy we echo on earth the song of the angels in heaven as they praise your, your glory forever. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, we give you praise, Father most holy, for you are great and you have fashioned all your works in wisdom and in love. You formed man in your own image and entrusted the whole world to his care so that in serving you alone, the creator, he might have dominion over all creatures. And when through disobedience he had lost your friendship, you did not abandon him to the domain of death, for you came in mercy to the aid of all, so that those who seek might find you. Time and again you offered them covenants, and through the prophets taught them to look forward to salvation. And you so loved the world, Father, most holy, that in the fullness of time, you sent your only begotten Son to be our Savior. Made incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he shared our human nature in all things but sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners freedom, and to the sorrowful of heart joy. To accomplish your plan, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the dead, he destroyed death and restored life, and that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again, he sent the Holy Spirit from you, Father, as the first fruits of those who believe, so that bringing to perfection his work in the world, he might sanctify creation to the, to the full. Therefore, Lord, we pray, may your same Holy Spirit graciously sanctify these offerings that they may become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the celebration of this mystery, which he himself left us as an eternal covenant. For when the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, Father, most holy, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And while they were at supper, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In a similar way, taking the cup filled with the fruit of the vine, he gave thanks and gave the cup to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, we remember Christ's death and his ascent to the realm of the dead. We proclaim his resurrection and ascension to your right hand. And as we wait his coming in glory, we offer you his body and blood. Look, O Lord, upon the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which you yourself have provided for your church, and grant in your loving kindness to all who partake of this one bread and one cup, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, 
they may truly become a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your glory. Therefore, Lord, remember me, your unworthy servant, Bishop David, the Bishop of this diocese, and the whole order of bishops. Remember all the clergy, especially those who take part in this offering, as well as your people gathered here before you, seeking you with sincere hearts. To all of us, your children, grant, O merciful Father, that we may enter into a heavenly inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and with your apostles and saints in your kingdom. There, with the whole creation freed from the corruption of sin and death, may we glorify you through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the, whole, on the world all that is good. By him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the coming of the kingdom as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven. but deliver us from evil. And it's the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. The gifts of God.
us pray, eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle, be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who roam throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Remember the gospel that God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against him. God loves you. God has forgiven you. God is not angry at you, and God will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and with those you love and care for this day and forever. Amen. Blessing on these men as they go forth in their faith. Remember the gospel. 